You're listening to the Braver Angels Podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. Okay, and I am joined by my uh, comrade in arms, um, Batman's my Robin, Robin's my Batman, however it is, uh, folks want to want to spice it up. The one and only Kieran Justice O'Connor. Kieran, how are you doing today, man? It's been a minute since I've I'm, seen you. It has been a minute. I'm good. Spring has sprung in New York City. The, the birds are chirping. I've got my Hawaiian shirt on, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's our second conversation with Tristan, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we are joined <laughs> by a digital ethicist, uh, president for the Center of Humane Technology, Center for Humane Technology, pardon me, uh, and star of the Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix, which I highly recommend folks see just in case you have not yet. Mr. Tristan Harris. Tristan, how are you doing, my friend? Great to be here with you guys. I'm really excited to have this conversation. And, and as I've said so many times, I am such a fan of the work you and Braver Angels are doing. Uh, it's so needed and uh, excited to, to talk. Well, the feeling is very much mutual. I can absolutely say that with sincerity. So let's, um, let's dig right in. Um, now, your work has been heralded as really sort of sounding a clear call for an adjustment in our appreciation of the digital and social media landscape, how it is that the culture and output of Silicon Valley is affecting our culture, our ability to reason together. Many people have pointed out problems with Twitter and Facebook and social media platforms in particular, uh, tendency to uh, uh, negatively sort of affect the way we communicate with each other and process information. But you've really sort of brought an awareness to this uh, field of concern in a deep way that is having noticeable, I think, impacts on the cultural conversation. There are very few people that a person can readily say that about, and you are one of them. I'd like to start um, here, though, getting a little bit of insight on yourself and where this journey began with you. Uh, you are a person who uh, has had deep experience within Silicon Valley, working with some of the big name companies with which we are all very much familiar. Can you tell us a little bit about where your relevant experience begins and take us on the journey that's ultimately sort of led you to the place of focus that you currently occupy? Yeah, sure. Um, gosh, where, where to begin? Um, well, in the mother's womb, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and uh, after after some good gestation period, um, I, you know, I developed an interest in technology very early. Um, I was about five or six when I think I got my, my first computer, and it was actually a Mac LC2. And just to say my orientation, because many people might think from seeing the social dilemma that I might be some kind of Luddite, some kind of anti-technologist, right, that we just should get rid of all of it, uh, and that's the message that um, we come bringing. Um, and this is yet another moral panic uh, that, you know, about social media that is uh, overblown. And I, I kind of want to give people maybe some background as to why um, they shouldn't think that. Uh, I actually was really enthralled by uh, my early experiences with technology, specifically the Macintosh and HyperCard and these sort of early precursors to the, what we now call the World Wide Web. Um, Bill Atkinson, who was the inventor of this program called HyperCard, was my hero. Uh, I think he had an LSD <laughs> trip and it had him uh, actually envision this thing called, called HyperCard, which allowed you to create these interconnected um, stacks, he called them, which is basically a series of cards that you could link together with buttons and text. And when you click here, make it make this sound and then go to this other card. So it's kind of like precursor to the internet and multimedia. And this is back in 1985. Um, mm. It was just astonishing. And I felt so connected to the culture that created uh, the Macintosh that I thought I wanted to work for Apple and change the world and become part of what would be the next Macintosh team. And since I was about 11 or 12 years old, that was my original vision of what I thought I wanted to do in my life. Um, and I actually ended up uh, working at Apple, um, building some things that are still part of every Macintosh and still shipping, uh, uh, which is kind of cool at 10 years later, your inventions are still um, you know, existing in the world. Uh, and I, I studied computer science at Stanford, uh, studied with uh, Terry Winograd, who um, especially was a famous AI artificial intelligence researcher and um, uh, 
uh, part of a field called human computer interaction, which studies the interface right between humans and computers. Mm. And uh, Terry was actually also the advisor of the Google founders. Um, so I was proud to be able to uh, get to know him during my time at Stanford. And during my time at Stanford, I became interested in, in another professor by the name of BJ Fogg, who studied persuasive technology. He had a lab at Stanford called Persuasive Technology Lab, where he was taking the intersection of psychology and persuasion. What influences are attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors? Uh, and everything we know about the field of psychology and persuasion. So, you know, from slot machines and clicker training for dogs, you know, click, click, reward. Oh, you did the thing I want you to do. Click, click, no, don't do that thing. Um, all the way to, you know, social psychology and cults and learning theory and, you know, uh, manipulation and, um, you know, propaganda, Edward Bernays. You know, you, we sort of studied the gamut of what are the influences on the human mind? And when I took this class at Stanford um, in 2006, keep in mind, this is the year before the iPhone came out. So this is pretty early. I was actually project partners with the founder of Instagram, Mike Krieger, uh, who was a very close friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I became kind of alarmed with, if this were to be used at scale, persuasive technology, technology that could influence our attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, um, this would be incredibly dangerous in the future. And I um, remember it was the final class uh, in that course, which was on the ethics and the future of persuasive technology. Let's zoom ahead, you know, a couple hundred, uh, sorry, excuse me, zoom ahead 10 years, you know, where are we gonna be? And one group came up with the idea that what if in the future, um, you know, John, we had a, uh, a map or a profile of what was persuasive to every mind on earth? You know, are you the kind of person who respects figures of authority. You know, if I said Harvard Medical School said this was true, would you be more persuaded by that versus if I said your, you know, your sister uh, was said this was true. Mm -hmm. um, if I used, um, uh, you know, appeals to authority versus if I use appeals to safety, if I use fear, are you a neurotic personality type? So we even thought about if you had the big five personality traits of uh, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. If you knew people's personalities, you would know a hell of a lot about how to persuade them. And as I took this course and became alarmed with all of that, I mean, obviously that idea is very alarming. It also brought back my experience with magic. Um, I was a magician as a kid and um, it brought back just the entire discipline that was kind of stored away in my mind as the human mind is very persuadable. Technology is now a vehicle of persuasion and we ought to be kind of concerned about where that could go. But I tabled that concern for a while. It was pre-iPhone. It was pre, um, it was the early days of Facebook. Um, famously, the next year at the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab class, they had a, a class dedicated to Facebook apps and how to make viral Facebook apps persuasive. And many of those alumni ended up joining the early ranks of Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And this became a kind of playbook of sorts for how to make these viral apps, you know, grow like crazy, right? So venture capitalists get their 100x return so that you go from 1 million users to 100 million to a billion users at faster and faster timescales. That's what we're seeing. You're seeing, you know, it took something like 10 years for Twitter to get, you know, however many 300 million users that it has now. Mm -hmm. um, and TikTok can hit 300 million users in like a year or two. Uh, and that time clip is getting faster and faster because we're better and better at persuading and creating those engagement loops. And so in general, when you plot the course of technology on different trajectories, we often talk about or worry about as a culture, you know, AI, and when is it going to take over from humans and the Terminator and the sort of bone crushing robots that'll like, you know, predict your next move and kill you, uh, mm -hmm. or AI taking our jobs. But we missed this much earlier point where technology doesn't overwhelm human strengths and intelligence and is smarter than us, but it actually just has to undermine human weaknesses. And that key insight on a timeline that that will occur much earlier than, than AI overwhelming human strengths, I think is exactly where we are and describes almost all of the major felt sense cultural harms of technology is where technology has undermined human weaknesses. And we can get into any of this uh, as you please, but um, I think this is a good frame for you know, where, where my concerns took me. I guess I didn't get to the last part, which is that I arrived at Google uh, through an acquisition of a company that I had had. I was a tech entrepreneur myself. And they bought a, a company that I was a part of. And um, a year into being at Google, uh, this is in the year 2012, I saw most of my friends, my friends had started Instagram, were still working on it. I had other friends who were building other social apps. And I just felt like the entire industry, instead of being concerned about how do we make humanity better, 
how do we help things, you know, how do we help people? How do we help po positive social impact? People became concerned with how do we keep people engaged? How do I get you to use my thing more than you use the other thing? How do I create and invent new notifications? So if previously Instagram would notify you when you got new likes or new comments, Path, and another social app, would notify you when someone looked at your photo. So imagine your phone buzzed every single time one of your other friends looked at one of your photos. And you would say, why are we doing that? Why would we vibrate phones in our pockets at scale hundreds of times a day because someone looked at your photo? And the answer was because it was really good at getting you to, to get sucked into the app. And again, I, what I noticed was just that there was this race for attention that was really at, at play behind the scenes in the industry. And that that was really the dominant force driving the direction of innovation and where technology was going. And it wasn't about making the world better or providing new market, you know, positive, you know, offering new uh, positive uh, experiences or products people could buy that would improve their lives. It was much more about treating people as commodities and persuading them. And I raised an alarm bell at Google, um, uh, making a presentation that's in, you know, covered in the social dilemma, the film, uh, in which I basically said, look, 10,000, excuse me, 100, uh, about 100 designers at three companies are influencing what a billion people think every day. Uh, and we as Google have a moral responsibility to get this right. You know, these 25 to 35 year old, mostly white male tech designers are basically in charge of the operating control room that operates the collective psyche of humanity. How are all the neurons wired up? How is all the information flowing? How is attention flowing? Do we even have such a thing as attention or free will? If you're basically mm -hmm. constantly undermining the processes that make up a more wise or thoughtful decision-making process. So these are the questions I started getting engaged with and that all led to you know, basically leaving Google and setting off on a course that was about waking the public up to what really is, I'm sure we'll get to, an existential threat, which is the technology undermining the kind of core life support systems of our um, civic societies and what makes society work because it is caught in this race to commodify uh, human attention and treat us as the, the product and not the customer. Mm. Indeed. <clears throat> Tristan, can you talk at all a little bit about your own politics and sort of your own ideological journey from being an adolescent to being at Stanford to being at Google to doing the social dilemma and sort of how that has either informed or been a reflection of this other journey that you've been taking through technology and ethics? Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I haven't ever really been a very political person. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area of California, um, in San Francisco, and then uh, later in, in Sonoma County. Um, so I was typically surrounded by, you know, liberal values, and um, you know, I, I, I thought you're going more. to. I thought you're going to tell us that at one point you were part of a militant radical centrist movement, such as was, <laughs> you know, illustrated in the social dilemma document. Yes, they, they did come up with a fake political party called the Extreme Center, um, which I is just that. a stand-in. Yes, um, I, I figured you guys would enjoy that. Um, you know, and the, the film tracks the course of um, you know a character Ben, um, a teenager who gets radicalized by social media because he's sent down the rabbit hole of the Extreme Center, and he clicks on one Extreme Center video and he gets a million more, and it kind of you know causes him to get down down this loop. Um, I don't think I went through any radicalization process in my own uh, story. I think, in, if anything, I went through a uh, increasing humility process. Um, I think part of my uh, journey has been learning how to question my own mind and learning how to uh, do inquiry on why you believe the things that you believe at a very deep level. I studied with a, um, one spiritual teacher named Byron Katie, um, teaches a very simple process of questioning, uh, limiting our false beliefs, uh, the four questions, which is you ask for any belief um, that's causing suffering, you know, uh, is it true? Can I be absolutely sure that it is true? You know, the Republicans cause climate change or, you know, whatever, whatever thing I might believe. Um, how do I react? So to, just to settle on that second question, how, uh, can I be absolutely sure that it is true that Republicans cause climate change? I, I don't know what the belief would be. Um, and you, you just realize that attaching any statement to reality like that is kind of like... Um, pulling a cover over the four corners of a bed and always having one corner pop up <laughs> because your description of reality is always incomplete. And it might have a partial truth. There's a reason why we're, we're um, coming from some of the beliefs that we are coming from, 
but it's more a product of the environments we grew up in and what people around us were saying that sounded credible and sounded reinforced. And from my knowledge of persuasion, I can kind of deconstruct my own believing, believing process as being around, and this is called social proof in psychology, that the more number of people around you say something is true, the more likely you are to believe that it's true. Because why mm -hmm. would, how could so many people be wrong, right? If everyone's saying it, it must be true. Um, which by the way, is one of the things that social media facilitates. Um, specifically, if you have, you know, 400 of your friends like a, a statement and it's, that's creating social proof around something being true. Um, if if mm. 1000 people are retweeting something, it makes it more persuasive that it might be real or might be true. Um, not to, not to interrupt get into you, more to that. not to interrupt you, but it makes me think about this. Um, well, it makes me think about a thought that I've had on a number of occasions, which is that we operate uh, when we look at the mass conflagration of polarized tribes uh, under the impression that millions of people are having arguments with each other, which you know is is true on some level. On another level, though, there is a way in which we are all of us passing around the same argument or some version of the same argument through millions of different channels, right? And so much of what we believe and attach so much conviction uh, to is itself not so much a product of, you know, deep and thorough self-reflection on the part of any one individual, but more so our sort of borrowing, you know, borrowing that conviction and that perspective and, you know, passing it through the filter of our own biases and experiences and presenting that argument or that point of view as our own. And sometimes I imagine that if you were to sort of whittle down the millions of people arguing about a certain point on any given side of an issue down to those who had gone through a process like what you undertook, where, wherein you just sort of, you know, bottom up, reevaluate the basis for all of your beliefs, how few people might you be left with on either side <laughs> of that conversation who had actually thought it all through for themselves? Anyway, that's just, that's just something that came to me as you were, as you were saying that. Yeah, completely. Um, I, I mean, it, it's incredibly difficult to choose the path of being, being willing to say that my core beliefs might be wrong. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, who wants to go through, look, you know, we, we want to stand in the shoulders of giants and why not stand in the shoulders of all your previous selves that have experienced reality and gone through their experiences and heard the social proof from so many people and family members and friends over all those years. And if you want to suddenly say, I'm going to discount all those things. I think what happened to me for me personally is I ended up encountering a, a group of very contrarian thinkers in San Francisco who um, uh, were very well practiced. It's actually uh, led by two friends of mine who were in a cult for 10 years. Um, they left that cult. Uh, they were actually in an arranged marriage and they went through the full process of how cults can kind of manipulate uh, people, identity, beliefs. And I got fascinated by cults because they, they are always offering something of, of deep value, usually something very healing to um, a large group of people. That's why people join um, because they're getting some kind of practice or community or belonging or meaning. Um, you know, or doing inner child work, or, you know, these kinds of things. And, uh, and, and, and yet I would be surprised that um, almost all cults have the same kind of failure modes, right? You have like a big ego of the founder, you have sexual dynamics between the founder and other people in the cult, you have uh, rewriting of language and meaning. So you have sort of the, the extraction of a person from their other friend groups so that they have less and less checks and balances on their own thinking, and they're more stuck within the circular reasoning of the cult. Mm -hmm. I spent about, you know, four or five years with these two friends uh, and the community that they put together um, uh, who, who really, they're high in something that in the, in the psychology literature we call construct awareness, which is your ability to be aware of the construct that you are in, you know, that the um, social norms, language, these are all ways of um, organizing our reality. And if you are not questioning them or if inquiry with them, uh, you are simply a product of them. There's a part of you that's almost like a robot that's right. running the code of some system that you're not seeing and people who've been in cults for a long time and came out of them and completely you know uh, question that entire experience are the most interesting because they've almost gone through the maximal construct awareness <laughs> uh, manipulation mm -hmm. and so it's almost like you know if you want to learn about protecting a bank you might want to spend time with the best bank robbers the ones who've been through the, the you know the, with the most awareness of the vulnerability of the bank mm -hmm. well if the bank is our own mind and our own minds meaning making reality you know, if we really want to understand persuasion, you want to spend time with the people who've seen the maximal degree of social psychological group manipulation. So that was really part of, you know, Kieran, when you asked me about my political background, it's really more about my own meaning making background and how, how I at least, you know, was able to question some of those things. And it strikes me that the 
process of intellectual humility or questioning one's own beliefs is probably becoming for a lot of people sort of an increasingly shattering experience because it's not just about intellectual humility, it's almost about de-identification. So people's identities are increasingly intertwined with their beliefs and social media, you share those beliefs as a badge that bolsters your own identity and sort of carves it into the ether. And so I think for people to try to undergo that process, it's very scary because they feel like they're, they're losing a piece of who they are. And I don't know if that's always been such the case. I think in the past you had um, more identities, your identity as a friend or a father or a community member or a Yankee fan, or in my, my case, a Mets fan. But now your identity is so tied up with your tribal allegiances and a relatively flat expression of politics that I think it makes it really hard for people to do that. And I wonder later in this discussion, as we talk about digital architecture, we might think a little bit about how can we sort of make it less scary? Yeah, indeed. I mean, we're interested, and I think we should get to that later, but, but the question of what would it look like for technology to be, um, if you view it as conditioning human behavior, human social norms, and human identity um, in our orientation in the world, it's not really orienting us towards epistemic humility or, or a humility about how do we know what we know. It rewards us for our certainty. And the more you broadcast your certainty, the more likes you get. If you say, well, I'm not really sure it could be this way, it could be that way, you're not gonna get nearly as many likes, comments, or retweets if you express humility, which is one of the problems in general in our society is that some of the wisest people are usually the most silent. Um, you know, the, the wisest are those who know that what they don't know, um, but those are not the people who we're gonna hear from the most often. And it's one of the other ways that social media distorts um, our attentional landscapes because those who are most vocal and most certain get all the airtime and participate more often as well. So it's a double whammy of uh, asymmetric um, representation. If you think of the fairness doctrine of um, you know, the 1980s of television, if you present one side, you have to present the other side. Well, social media is not democratically representing um, the views of, let's call it even, you call them one of the groups that's marginalized is wisdom. If you are wise, usually you're more silent, which means that silent people are just simply not <laughs> represented in our intellectual sphere. That's probably going to lead to some problems down the road. Mm -hmm. Right. Huh. So this, this, this leads me to all sorts of interesting sort of intuitive places here. I want to take a chance on something really quick and um, talk a little bit I, I rarely talk about myself, as people know, who listen to this podcast. But I'm going to break that rule very, very quickly. Being very sarcastic for any new listeners, by the way. Uh, many of you will already be irritated at my tendency to do this. But um, one person I actually talk a fair amount about on this uh, podcast is uh, uh, my father. Kieran and I, we talk about our dads a lot. Our dads uh, have a lot in common. We're trying to get them on the podcast at, at some point. But um, you used the word Luddite earlier, uh, Tristan. Uh, the perils of technology was actually a huge part, or the emphasis on the perils of technology was a huge part of my upbringing. Um, I, um, now my background, my family background is in music. And some people will know that my, uh, my, well, my mother danced on soul trains, R&B singer, my dad's a jazz pianist. His father was, uh, my grandfather was a major record industry uh, executive. He owned uh, Dot Records in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, but uh, dad, um, Grew, uh, raised me sort of with this story storyline that kind of wed what he perceived to be the decline of American culture to the decline of American uh, uh, popular music, uh, and that as a consequence of the introduction of technology in the recording process in the uh, early 1970s, in particular with the uh, advent of multi-track recording. Uh, something that you know, I, I guess maybe few people know who don't think about the history of music very much. Um, that's worth identifying. Here's the fact that back, if you go back to the 19, you know, well, really the entire history of recorded music up until the seventies, um, music was recorded live. You had in my dad's words, disciplined musicians who went into the studio uh, for a take. And uh, you know, back when my dad was growing up in recording studios, 
artists would record for three or four hours songs that they had rehearsed and rehearsed together as you know as uh, as bands and ensembles and if they knew the material they would produce uh, a version of the song that was good enough to make it to the album that would be released and as time went on uh, the process that went into recording an album wound up multiplying you know uh just about uh, logarithmically, because suddenly with the introduction of tracks in the recording process, musicians didn't have to be in the studio at the same time. Um, you know, the singer would record his or her vocals uh, in one session and wouldn't even necessarily sing the song all the way through as, as the recording uh, process sort of evolved, but would take a, a bar here and then record another bar there. And then after spending maybe a couple of weeks on the vocals, you bring in the guitar player, you bring in the drummer, or you would introduce, you know, the drum machine, which came, I think, in the in the 80s uh, with probably with disco and so forth. By the way, my, my father, I don't know if you've seen it, Tristan, but for folks who are interested in uh, music and bumper stickers, my dad had a bumper sticker that read uh, drum machines have no soul. Uh, he was the uh, the author of that sticker. And that was pretty popular uh, in Los Angeles and across the country for a time. Um, and so dad had this sort of social analysis, which sort of said, yeah, things started going downhill in America, when artists and musicians were removed from the recording process. And when we in music uh, forgot how to actually record and interact live with each other in a musical context, used to be that the recording that you heard was something that actually happened. But now with, you know, with, with disco with pop, with, with rap and hip hop and so forth, what you're hearing is a performance that never actually occurred. You're hearing something that was pieced together in various different parts and so forth. And so, you know, I, I, I think about all that because, you know, there was a part of me that thought, growing up, that was a profound observation. Then there's a part of me that thought, well, what does that really, what does that really matter? People like the music that they like and so on and so forth. And it's, and it's all well and good. Um, the part of what dad would talk about with respect to technology in general is the idea that it obliterates fixed points, that if you go back in time, people would have conversations that would not be interrupted by call waiting. You didn't have the anxiety of wondering who was leaving a message or who was leaving a message on your voicemail because you could hear them beeping on the other line. This is before cell phones and so forth. It used to be when you were having a conversation, you just had the conversation, you hung up the phone, then you checked your message. And if there was a message there, great. If there wasn't, that's fine. Part of what I've heard you talk about is the sort of the misalignment or misrepresentation of context in the way in which, say, social media feeds interact with timelines. Uh, uh, twi your Twitter feed, your Facebook feed, so on and so forth, doesn't produce a simple chronological timeline, wherein the most recently post item is uh, you know, reflected at the top of your feed and you work your way backwards. But part of the selection process takes place algorithmically to link what is shown to you to, uh, to, uh, on the on the basis of other items that you've sort of consumed, uh, therefore sort of triggering your interest to get you to spend more time on the platform. Um, part of what I've heard you talk about is this phenomenon where therein or, you know, through through retweeting, reposting, resharing, you can take a piece of content that was posted 10 years ago in an entirely different social context or landscape and reintroduce it as something new. So as perhaps to catalyze a fresh round of outrage over something uh, politically incorrect that somebody, you know, mentioned way back in time. And all of this sort of follows, I think, a little bit of a pattern that my dad identified really before, you know, social media was a thing. I mean, this you know, he he was telling me all. I grew up in the '90s. You and I are about the same age, but you know, I, I this was you know, my dad was sort of uh, making me sensitive, I guess, to this idea that technology had a way of disrupting the natural rhythms of life, even before this generation of of uh, usage and innovation came to be. And I'm wondering, uh, first of all, if you know, curious to get any reaction you have just to sort of that that particular version of Ludditism that, you know, that I just represented here. But secondly, you know, this idea that we are in a sense manipulating time in a way that would not have been really within the imagination of anybody prior to the advent of, you know, some of these technological phenomena, how does that impact our ability to exist in the world socially and psychologically? Um, and in other way, and in any any other way that may seem relevant to the issue at hand. Yeah, wonderful. Let me see if I can bookmark a couple of thoughts in case I forget some of my yeah, answers please. to your your uh, 
Uh, great opening here. So I heard you say a couple things. So one is about kind of the alignment of context. Um, we, we have warped the context from which speech occurred. Like you give the example of pulling back speech from eight years ago, as people tend to do with Lindsey Graham saying, oh, Trump will be the end of the Republican party and will deserve it or, you know, whatever he said. Sure. Um, and then saying it as in reference to something now and the kind of infinite ability to recombine things out of, out of context. And that's one sort of topic. The other is on this timeline point and the dimensionality and warping of time. So I want to name a couple different pieces that'll probably be building blocks for our conversation. Mm. Um, we often use in our work um, at the Center for Humane Technology, the, uh, the E.O. Wilson quote. Um, uh, E.O. Wilson was a sociobiologist from, from Harvard. He, he was the father of the field. And he said, when asked the question about, you know, can humanity survive the big problems that we're facing, whether it's climate change or, you know, whatever else. And he said, um, the fundamental problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. <laughs> I go back to this often. I, I know people, if they hear me on different podcasts or something, um, will hear me say this often, but I think it's such an important anchoring point to talk about what you're now talking about, which is what are our paleolithic emotions and brains? What were they evolved to see and understand and how are they evolved to have conversations or feel connection with other humans obviously we were not evolved to feel connection with other humans at a distance um, that doesn't mean that we can't do it i mean telephones were a revolutionary technology but um i mean arguable what kind of i'm sure that uh, in the sts field we can find many negative examples of some things that that caused but telephones i think overall retained some of the context that is important about human relationships tone, prosody, intimacy. Um, uh, it brings together a lot of the context that, um, that, that we need for effective, meaningful communication, less ambiguity, et cetera. When you move into text, um, and let's say the world of text before we had emojis, one of the famous studies from that I remember doing in, on this early work on humane technology was uh, all the ways that we overestimate our interpretations of other people's speech over text, uh, especially without emoji. Um, you know, if your partner uh, sends you a text saying, you know, say, hey, could you get me a coffee? And they say, yes, period. And, and normally <laughs> they would say, yes, lovey, smiley face, kissy face, or whatever the thing would be. Mm. And then you think, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Or did they hate me? And it's like they were in a rush and someone called them right there and they had to hit send right before the thing. Mm. But you're misinterpreting that as like, now there's something wrong with my partner. Now your mind is looping on some other process being like, is there something wrong? And then you go talk to your friend and you, and people end up in these weird loops of misinterpreting each other's speech. I spend because we're minutes losing at a that time, dimension of context. I spend minutes at a time agonizing over whether or not a, a, a period is too flat sounding or an exclamation point is too excited. You know, right. I, I frequently emotionally I feel like I'm in between most of the time. And yet those are those are my choices, unless I just don't use one at all. Anyway, pardon me. John, right, you, so, you end every Slack message with a period. That's I've noticed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you did call me well, out it, the other day. <laughs> and in part, maybe we've become accustomed to the high stakes nature of text communication that we now realize, you know, 10 years into this, uh, you know, maybe 20 years into this, depending on how you're counting the starting times, um, that we got to be really, especially over digital communication, we have to be pretty careful about how we're communicating. But of course, as we move into the world of the rapid, fast-paced, bite-sized, bursty attention economy, where we are sifting through a million more things per day on the go, we have less and less time to maybe express ourselves accurately. And so, um, you know, I think of the emoji as a humane technology. In fact, just to really quickly go back, um, there's actually a study about how often, especially romantic couples, uh, misinterpret the intentions of their partner over text. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and emojis, I think, were a humane technology at retrieving some of that lost context of emotion um, that I remember when I first saw emojis, I thought this is uh, a bizarre kid like toy. I'm not going to communicate like that. I'm, I'm an adult. I'm not going to use, you know, these cartoons uh, <laughs> to communicate. And um, it's been interesting actually talk about, you know, updates in your own belief system and where you change your mind. I mean, I changed my mind about, about emojis and using them because I saw that they were uh, a powerful way to, to add some, some humanness back into the lost context that we lost. Now let's go to the time piece because it back to, to the topic of your work at Braver Angels. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're all worried about polarization. We're all worried about the fact that our conversations are looking more like premeditated combat and fights. Like we, we walk in believing that, oh, I think I know what you're about to say. And I think I already disagree with that. We have to be able to unwind that whole thing. Okay, so we already know that humans are, you know, not 
always perfectly skilled at having opposite pointed, you know, view conversations. Um, that's why we had to invent things like nonviolent communication or active listening or some of the processes that that you guys invented. Now, that's just human communication starting point. Now you add in social media and you say, is that making it better or is it making it worse? So now to your point about time, John, you're talking about the recording of these different tracks at different times. What you said made me think of the fact that that's exactly what arguments look like on social media. Yes. They're, all, yes. they're almost never yeah. occurring at the right? same time. <laughs> uh, in fact, Twitter's business model is to record these different statements that are made at different times and then put them together. It's like, really, if I open up Twitter right now, which I actually don't want to do, but if I were to look at it right now, the felt sense in my paleolithic emotional brain is that I'm looking at, even though it says that this was tweeted 10 hours ago and this was tweeted at five hours ago, it has this sense that there's something that's like, this is the live stream. There's something that's alive about this. It's the present moment. I can watch it for me. It's, you know, 9, 19 a.m. or whatever. And I'm in the present moment looking at this thing. But it's not. It's this weird multi-track thing, which was recorded at different moments in time. The people weren't actually in the same place at the same time saying any of these things. They're responding and getting angry at something from maybe a tweet that's two days ago. If we want to think about where this went wrong, I mean, imagine, um, you know, if you think about your paleolithic brain and the emotion of outrage, you know, so outrage comes over you. It has a kind of a half-life. Okay, so how long does it take for outrage to peak? You know, what's the coming up period on outrage? And then how long does average uh, outrage stay? And then how long does it take to dissipate through your body? How long is it affecting your reactivity, your choices, your impulsiveness? We could map out a curve, a response curve, like a dose response curve for a drug or something like that for how outrage affects your endocrine system, your um, emotions, just your felt sense in your whole body, how it changes your breathing. There's a real thing there, right? Okay, so now you imagine that same paleolithic emotion. You're, that outrage is going to work a certain way. That dose response curve, you know, you're born with that, you're baked with that, you're not going to change that in your meat suit. Okay, right. so now you say um, there's outrage happening in one context. Let's say you're on a freeway, car, you know, turns in front of you and you get really upset at the person. Okay, you're upset for a moment. You might, you know, yell for a moment. You might get mindful for a moment. Say, oh, maybe I shouldn't yell. But then there's, um, it, it's gone. You know, 30 minutes later, you're not usually still stuck or trapped in that outrage moment. And your digital environment, there you are in that truck. The truck doesn't say, hey, hold on a second. Don't you want to um, uh, see, hang on to that outrage some more? Or we're going to post to your other friends and other trucks and say, hey, your other friend just got um, someone swiped in front of them. Do you want to get angry and yell and just join the comment thread and get angry at that other truck for, for driving in front of Tristan? Like, no, it doesn't, doesn't do obviously any of that. And if you think about what Twitter does is it's never been easier for, for momentary outrage or momentary conflict to snowball into a big pool where everyone can pile on to seeing these moments as they pass. Um, and it's also true if you make a mistake, um, people are one of the side effects of social media right now is people are actually, some people are worried to share it all because they know that one thing taken out of context can turn into a snowball. And by the time that they try to post a correction or say, no, I didn't mean that the whole world has piled on to the original uh, mm. misspoken statement. Yeah. And it creates all of these secondary side effects in which, and, and let's be clear, uh, just to, to link this for your listeners back to how social media has done this. It's not just this accident. It's, I want to connect it to the business model of why the business model, as we say in the social dilemma, is the kind of core problem inside of our social platforms, which is to say that they benefit from harvesting human attention, right? Their business model, how much have you paid for your Twitter account recently, your Facebook, YouTube account, pay, haven't paid anything. So how, how is Twitter worth, you know, whatever it is now, $400 million or something. Hmm. Um, and it's because they monetize our attention. It's not their data. It's the attention. They have to get your attention. And how do they do that? Well, if you open up Twitter and if they just had today's tweets to show you, it wouldn't be nearly as compelling as finding over the last 72 hour period, in case you missed it, here's all these moments where someone cut off someone else on a metaphorical freeway on the online world. And it pulls all of those moments together and then it actually stacks them. So now you're seeing everyone getting cut off on the freeway in some totally bizarre, it's like you said, it's a new temporality, right? We're, we're actually weaving together the separate multi-track instrument recordings of outrage. And we're weaving them together into this cacophony of outrage and conflict in a way that was actually never uh, organic, it, both in its own natural construction and also not organic for our minds to process. So now that, that immediate sort of dose response curve of outrage running through my body gets actually a rep, uh, repeated stimulus. I got repetition. I, my brain uses um, the frequency of something to estimate how common or prevalent it is. So when you, when you experience something really quickly, in fact, we had a, 
on our podcast, uh, we recently had on a, um, a child developmental psychologist who talked about uh, belief formation. And when you get um, uh, evidence for a, a new belief rapidly, really quick at the beginning, before you've actually set in motion your, your opinion about something, it can really strongly influence your view in the world about how common that thing is. And Twitter makes it so it's never been easier to get a, um, a, a overinflated view of how common these conflicts are and how many people hold the views that lead to those conflicts, which lead to, uh, writ large, overestimating the number of people who hold extreme views in society, how conflicted we really are, versus if no one was using social media at all, how often would your nervous system, encountering the raw phenomenological world out there, would it feel like the whole world is on fire and everyone's in conflict? And it's really interesting to, to consider that. It's so hard to consider that opposite reality because our, our whole society has been hijacked with a brain implant that it now cannot remove. Because even if I choose not to use Twitter, I can't depend on the fact that everyone else that I know is, and my democracy that I'm gonna, that everyone's voting in is gonna be the product of what that information environment has done. So I, I don't know if that's helpful context, but that's what your comment made me think about in terms of weaving together in irregular and abnormal ways um, in, in a temporality into temporality that that is um, really been damaging and it's directly again connected to uh, the business model. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. So there's this recontextualization of our reality that gives us a false sense of, you know, just sort of what the proportional distribution of either certain uh, ways of looking at the world or certain events actually happen to be. Um, you know, I mean, I, I want to be careful here because I could I could come up with examples that would be controversial for for good reasons. But, you know, to sort of wade into one, obviously, you know, we have an ongoing uh, conversation in this country on you know criminal justice reform, policing, uh, the phenomenon of you know uh, unarmed black men being shot and killed by by law enforcement. I'm a person who happens to believe that there's deep reforms that need to be made to uh, criminal justice uh, to the criminal justice system. And that that doesn't necessarily mean that every um, claim that is made in terms of the frequency with which with respect to how often certain tragic events uh, unfold gives us an accurate understanding of the larger sort of, you know, uh, material reality of that issue. It's a bit of a side conversation, but it does present a clear uh, and present danger with respect to our being able to get an accurate empirical grasp on reality when you have a misrepresentation of the frequency within which with which certain types of communications are taking place, et cetera, et cetera. There's another component to this that I think dad was kind of highlighting in his, uh, you know, sort of musical analogy for reality. And that is this idea that interpersonally we're as artists and musicians, taking it back to the music context, that we are losing some of our ability to actually be able to sort of preserve that original craft of musical communication, right? Because it's intuitive and it relies upon you being occupying sort of a, a space with somebody in real time. And um, I, I liked what you, uh, you, you used the, you came close to using the term uh, multi-track communication or something like that, which is a phrase that I, I never thought of before, but it does precisely apply the musical analogy to our communication uh, structure here. Um, you know, I, I, th there's been a lot, and I'm sure you're probably familiar with some of the literature on this uh, front, but I mean, you know, there has been much made of the idea that particularly people of a certain generation, certain younger generation, oftentimes have difficulty with interpersonal communication even with respect to sort of maintaining eye contact, right? Um, because we've become so tethered to sort of a depersonalized way of communicating digitally that we're losing some of the interpersonal arts that have tended to be, you know, at the heart of relationship building, certainly, right? Um, and um, as we think about the work of kind of constructing, potentially at least constructing shared spaces in the digital um, domain where we can begin to build communication with each other more constructively and in socially more positive ways. Um, I, I wonder, you know, what, um, what, what you see as the riddle that has to be solved, so to speak. I, I'm wondering if you can encapsulate this. What is the riddle that has to be solved in order to allow us to you know, um, sort of immerse ourselves 
in a humane culture of digital interaction. And I want you to speak to that word humane because your organization is called the Center for Humane Technology. And that word, I don't think is just incidental in, 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 in the title. Humane actually has, it, it has real philosophical substance to it uh, in the context of what it is we need to sort of capture in, uh, you know, in, in a higher understanding of what technologically facilitated community building and, and communication could be. So can you speak to this idea of what humane technology is and, and what is the riddle that that is trying to solve, not just in terms of, you know, engaging the negative problem of polarization and societal fracturing, but in terms of perhaps aiming towards a positive good of facilitating a, a deeper kind of, you know, and, and ultimately a better kind of connection between human beings in the digital space. Yeah, wonderful. Um, let's speak first to the the riddle that we're trying to face, because maybe we haven't appropriately established that. So I just want to lay some groundwork, maybe briefly for your listeners, mm -hmm. about what is the problem that we're setting out to solve here. So obviously, polarization online is one of the big uh, features of, of the conversation. But I want to connect it to something more broadly that we call the climate change of culture, which is that when you have one business model um, that treats human attention um, as the commodity that needs to get sold. It means that much like we now, you know, domesticate cows for their milk and for their meat. In other words, we, we don't have regular cows anymore. We have the kind of cows that are best for our extractive uses of cows, right? So we, we get a new species of cow in a way, right? I want to argue that we're kind of domesticating humans into a new species of humans in this long-term diffuse, blur your eyes kind of abstract way that in a business model that values us for dead slabs of zombified human attention, that there you are scrolling, clicking, yelling at other people, um, uh, all because that's profitable. We are worth more when we are uh, not out there with our friends having conversations in person groups with braver angels. Uh, that's not worth a lot to YouTube. That's not worth a lot to Facebook. Um, uh, when kids are out there on camping trips and hiking trips um, or playing on a school uh, playground, that's not worth as much to YouTube or to Facebook or to Khan Academy, um, not to put Khan Academy in some negative light. Um, so the problem is in a business model, uh, which values our attention, we're worth more when we are addicted, distracted, outraged, polarized, narcissistic, and disinformed. Narcissistic in the sense that we, we're worth more when kids are seeking social validation and care about, do they have 20 more likes than the last time I checked five minutes ago? That's a more profitable user than one who's not using it very often. Um, a user who comes back tomorrow is more profitable than a user who only uses it once a week. Um, so much like in you know, our medical system where it's much more profitable to have someone get diabetes and then sell them a subscription plan of treatments than it is to have a medical system that prevents them from getting sick at all. We have a fundamental perverse incentive here. And I just wanted to name that because that connects to the second piece of the riddle that we're in, which is the climate change of culture, because that set of effects, addicted, distracted, polarized, outraged, disinformed, has a certain kind of quality. We're being domesticated into a different kind of human. Notice mm. kind of harder to read a book uh, now than it was. Uh, I don't know if some people would say that's easier. I certainly I, don't know anybody. I, who would. I have noticed. Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> talk to any teacher um, and they'll tell you uh, the difference in how kids look and feel and act in the classroom, both online and, and offline. Uh, even before the pandemic, um, the shortening of attention spans, the amount of drama that is generated on social media that they have to clear and spend the first two hours of classroom time clearing, the way that it affects our politics uh, makes us more certain, gets us more validated and certain for views that might even be fringe, where if you previously were a, you know, a neo-Nazi and said, you know, we really should bring back this ideology from the uh, 1930s, um, you probably have to show up at a YMCA with some pull-out chairs and box of Dunkin' Donuts or something and not that many people would show up and you, you would get a signal that maybe that's not the best idea in these times. But in this world, uh, you can post something in a neo-Nazi uh, Facebook group and it will get 400 likes and, and you'll feel validated. The more extreme th thing that you share, the more likes it'll get, the more validated it'll feel, the more truth it must be, the more true it must be. So these are all effects of this climate change of culture that have taken place over the last you know, 15, 20 years. Um, I would... You know, social media was an accelerant uh, on it. And I want to make sure we're naming that this is not that social media creates out of a vacuum polarization. It finds fault lines where they exist and it reinforces those fault lines. It's like AI precision guided fault line finding in society because mask, anti-mask, vaccine, anti-vaccine, 
put the American flag in your profile, anti-American flag in your profile. It sorts for all of the things where we disagree because those things get more attention. And once you realize that and you say, okay, now let's rewind the clock and think about this society going around in this washing machines over and over and over and over again. And it spits out this new kind of domesticated society where you have people mm. just acting like toddlers, right? We, we have been conditioned into being more like children without our higher level capacities. And that's where it's left us. So now we get to the polarization piece, which is one of the big pillars of this climate change of culture, one of the big externality categories. Um, uh, uh, so now, you know, what do we do to repair that? Well, the first thing is we have to be able to have a shared understanding about why and how we've lost shared understanding um, because so we have to acknowledge and all see this kind of warping of society that's taking place from this washing machine of social media so that we all have a common um, view about why things look this way. If we don't share that understanding and some people are just in it as opposed to being able to climb up to a perch above and we can name it as a shared object that happened to all of us, then we're gonna be trapped inside the cacophony. We're gonna keep getting into arguments but we have to have a shared view that's above all that. So I think it's important to name that because that's a precondition for then thinking about what would it look like for technology to be humane and to heal that? Because the first step is we have to in that, like I said, and I didn't actually finish when I told you at the beginning about these four questions, you know, is it true? Can I be absolutely sure it's true? How do I react? What happens for me when I think that thought, that belief, and if I treat it as true? And who would I be? The fourth question is who would I be without that thought? We almost need to go through that whole kind of process with the like conglomeration of the last 10 years of this warping of our collective psyche that's given us this inflated sense of certainty, inflated tribalism, uh, the rest of it, you know, you, the stuff that you guys work on all the time. So we, I think one big trillion dollar question is how do you unwind that kind of warping? I mean, it's kind of like a societal dementia. It's a, it's a very weird derangement of how we've all been seeing the world. Um, obviously, the work that you are doing is one huge part of that. But I think in addition to that, we need to all have a common view about that having happened to us. I think The Social Dilemma as a film, um, which is seen, by the way, it broke records for Netflix. I think it's the, either the number one or number two record-breaking documentary in Netflix's history. It was seen yeah. by 130 million people in 190 countries and 30 languages. And I think that's one thing that, you know, that gets us there. But as to your, to your question, John, the ultimate point here is to get to a world of technology that is humane. And to your question about the philosophy of that term, it comes from uh, my co-founder, Aza Raskin, and his father, Jeff Raskin, who actually invented the Macintosh project uh, at Apple in like 1980. He started that project and he wrote a book later in his life called The Humane Interface, where he said humane technology is technology that is considerate, uh, respectful of human needs and considerate of human frailties. It is understanding and wrapping around ergonomically human frailties so that is not to make them maladaptive to a current cultural environment. And we extend that term because that was back in the 1980s to humane technology has to be understanding of human vulnerabilities, weaknesses, our paleolithic emotions and biases and be wrapping around that in a way so that it doesn't cause exploitation or negligence over that very uh, gentle and, and fragile terrain of how our psyche interacts with the world. Mm -hmm. So an example is if our brains don't do well without emotional context or signals so that when I speak to you and I have a smirk or smile on my face, and it's different than if I spoke to you stoically and I was kind of autistic and I just spoke to you like this and you're not getting those signals, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lack of, there's of the, some of that context that's coming through. So emojis are a humane technology because they're actually reintroducing some of that needed context for our minds from their evolutionary environment to do the appropriate thing, which is to build a relationship with you. One of the things that's lost in social media land is when we have a genuine relation with someone, think of someone you know really well. And if they say something that um, is actually polarizing or um, you know, actually almost uh, harmful, um, we give them the benefit of the doubt because we have a relationship with them. We say, well, maybe they couldn't have meant that extreme of a thing because I know them as a person. I know where their values are. And maybe they made a mistake, but we won't just jump to now we need to go to war with you because this you're, is how you're Karen back. manages his relationship with me on a, you know, on a regular <laughs> basis. Right. Well, and so if you think about what social media does is we never see, we don't have a set of relationships undergirding this virtual sphere where we're getting into arguments with each other. And to the extent we have relationships, it frays at those relationships. We don't speak to those people as much in real time. And when you have 140 characters to express yourself, and if it's ambiguous, I personally have had very close friends who've said things that 
that I feel unproud of and um, would be upset about. But I, I, I know that behind the scenes, I know that person's views. And so I can tell that there's some kind of miscommunication that's happening mm. in that public setting. I think other guests you've had on this podcast, I think might, might feel similarly. And it's interesting when you talk to them in an audio context, as you mm. did with you know, either James Lindsay or others, not to endorse anyone's views, but just to get a sense of there's something behind why someone might say something that without that context feels absurd or offensive or horrible. Yes. And if we don't have those relationships that are undergirding um, speech uh, that is actually going directly into these more conflicting topics, um, it's going to lead to, to more conflict. So it, it's a stacked problem, but what we need to have for humane technology are things that help us understand each other better. And I just want to give one more example before I turn it back over to you. We love it. There's a group uh, we love speaking with. Um, it's one of your peers called More in Common. Um, and Dan Ballone, we had in our podcast uh, uh, to talk about their work on perception gaps, which is a measure of not whether a belief is true. You know, is racism still a problem in this country? Or, you know, is climate change happening? Or when is it going to happen? That's hard for a social media company when it's an abstract topic to adjudicate with content moderators, you know, what's true, what's not true. And it's an abs these are abstract topics. Um, so you can't adjudicate those easily, but what you can do is measure, can Democrats accurately predict what Republicans believe about whether racism is still a problem? Because you can just ask both groups and then you can get a sense of, are they able to, you know, are, are they able to accurately measure the percentage of Republicans that believe that or not? And what they found in general is that we overestimate the number of people holding extreme views by quite a lot. I think we estimate 55% of people hold extreme views. The actual number is something closer to 35 or 30%, I believe. Um, if you ask uh, Democrats, you know, what percentage of Republicans make $250,000 a year, uh, they'll say about a third of Republicans make more than $250,000 a year, when the actual number is 2%. If you ask uh, Republicans what percentage of Democrats are LGBTQ, um, they'll say, oh, a third of Democrats are LGBTQ, but actually only 2, uh, 6% are. And so we're, we're living uh, in, our, in our world through these meaning-making lenses of stereotypes. You know, the same way that you have far-sighted glasses on, we have stereotype-sighted glasses on. We are seeing the world through stereotypes and getting into arguments with mirages of human beings, with mirages of tribes that are those extreme uh, sides. And the reason I bring this up is if you think about humane technology, um, the current status quo in their research is the more that you use media and social media, the worse your perception gaps are. So the right. longer you spend on social media, and, and even independent of education, by the way, in fact, it's worse for people apparently on the left who are the more educated you are on the left um, and the more media you use, the, the even worse your perception gaps are because you become even more certain about uh, where people stand. Um, and if you think about that as kind of an anti-humane technology, because if you think about someone walking into a regular context or room where they wanna get an argument with someone, but they literally don't even know the opponent's side, you're not having a real conversation. And um, a humane world would be one in which just like active listening, um, you would make a point, John and uh, Kieran, and I would respond to it and say, okay, I think what you said was this, and this is what you said. And if, do I have that right before I respond to the thing that, that you're saying? Right. Well, um, you could imagine technology that actually automatically shows us the kind of media, because it can measure which of the kinds of post articles, news websites that tend to reduce perception gaps over time, because it can ask that question. And then how do I show you more of that stuff and less of the stuff that increases perception gaps? And that was one of the insights that came out of our conversation with Dan. And I bring it up because what we want to live in a more humane world is the longer time you spend on media at all, hopefully the lower people's perception gaps would get. It's almost like computational empathy, where you're actually in some more automated way, showing people the kinds of things that allow them to better estimate what other sides actually believe. And because I think you and I, and all of us here on this call are really interested in a humane technology world, since we're all surrendered to this digital infrastructure we're now embedded in, more and more of our country, our economy, our communications, our children's development is actually occurring through this digital infrastructure. If Biden passes a $3 trillion you know, stimulus package, but it just gives us broadband versions of today's infrastructure, then it's not really helping because we get broadband polarization, we get broadband screwing with kids' mental health, we get broadband depression and isolation. It, we need to actually move into a digital infrastructure that's humane where we actually change the business models of technology so we can do things like have the default experience be reducing perception gaps, have the default experience be increasing our attention spans, not decreasing them, have the default experience be helping us find the common ground. Um, I could give many different examples, but that the idea that technology that puts um, human bugs or human weaknesses at the center, human fragility at the center, so you can design for the most uplifting and wisest capacity of humans is what we're really after here. And it really goes full circle to we have to align this equation that E.O. Wilson gave us 
of Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and accelerating godlike technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask about the potential for some of these new models and also how we might anticipate some of the criticism and pushback that we might get. Um, you know, when you think about the epistemological dimension and the fact that people perceive the world to be so much more extreme and conflict ridden than it actually is. I mean, the previous model was you had sort of gatekeepers, right? You know, media gatekeepers who came with their own biases and oftentimes represented a pretty small slice of America, but were sort of doing their best to synthesize lots of different information and then present it in a way that reflected a shared reality. Um, and obviously, we're, we're never going back to that model. And I think there's, you know, obviously lots of legitimate criticisms with it. But as we think about new models uh, that might have algorithms that reduce perception gaps, I think you're also going to run into pushback from people who say, well, I don't want gatekeepers. You know, I don't want this platform to be uh, telling me what's real and what's not. Um, how do you think about that issue? Because obviously creating a model is one thing, but then also making it appealing and, and sellable and scalable is another. Yeah, terrific question. I mean, on the second point, which I think um, just to give you an insight into the tech industry and speak more to that side of things, one of the things that prevented a lot of change uh, from happening um, starting in 2013, 14, I started having conversations with my friends who were at the tech companies, right? I was like, you know, Facebook's addictive. You guys are manipulating people. You're writing comeback emails to people. Um, you're, you know, ranking the outrage to the top. And the, the most common response you get is we're just a neutral platform. We're holding up a mirror to society. If those are your conspiracy theorists, we're really sorry that that's just happening in your country, you know, but, you know, who are we to say what's good for people? Who are we to say what's true? We shouldn't be the ones making those choices. We're not the arbiters of truth. We don't want to be the ministry of truth. You don't want us to be the ministry of truth. And so right. we don't want to put our hand on the scale. So don't tell us to. Um, or how would you get around that? Well, the problem is if I take my hand off the steering wheel, not choosing is the same as choosing, but it's choosing a amorality becomes immorality. Because if, if the take my hand off the steering wheel approach leads to more polarization, because you're putting a feedback loop on outrage, leads to more kids' mental health problems and cyberbullying, and uh, kids who are cyberbullied have a three times increased risk of suicide. And we're seeing an increased risk in teen suicides and depression. So we know that taking our hand off the steering wheel is leading to like the worst of results. And there's not not choosing. The question is, how do you consciously choose from a place of wisdom? Because again, Mark Zuckerberg has godlike power over the front page of the collective psyche of humanity. Mm. You know, it's how we wake up in the morning. It's how we go to bed in the morning. It's, it's the entire fabric from which we do meaning making. And again, even if an individual listening to this podcast says, oh, well, you know, I don't actually use Facebook or TikTok or whatever. You still live in a country where everyone else does. And your next election will be dictated by that. So all of us are in the same boat around how we navigate through this crisis. And again, the question is going to become, like you're saying, so, you know, I, to, to respond to you directly, Karen, you're saying, if I heard you correctly, <laughs> did you active listening, that um, uh, uh, I don't want gatekeepers deciding, um, how, how do we not have gatekeepers deciding uh, what's true? Because we know where that world led us. In a way, we have a weird set of AI gatekeepers right now. And those AI gatekeepers are making sure we're hearing from the people with the most extreme views and the most conflict-ridden speech and we're not really hearing from all those people. There's a lot, there's this huge sort of long tail of all those people who are sharing important things, but in a subtle way where they didn't copyright, uh, they didn't do um, marketing copy on their tweet to get it to go viral. They didn't put breaking in all caps. They didn't put the three emojis at the beginning. They're not doing those things because they're just sharing calm speech. Now you could say, well, it's a marketplace of ideas and their speech, if it was important, would get rewarded. But that's just not true in the evidence of how, you know, that's actually playing out right now. But that's kind of, frankly, one of the biggest things when you talk about changing the tech industry that we have to uh, overturn is this idea that these are neutral platforms. They're not a mirror for society. Think of it like a funhouse mirror that has actually been warping and selecting for the parts of your society that are best at getting attention. And that's equivalent to driving down the freeway and having the things people look at to get attention, which is the car crashes, filling up our news feeds and filling up our lives on a self-reinforcing loop. So now suddenly the whole world starts to look like car crashes. That's kind of I think, my response to that. So, so interesting thought experiment just to make it concrete. So Mark Zuckerberg comes to you and says, I'm retiring tomorrow. Tristan Harris is my successor. <laughs> you know, you have a, a couple of weeks to gather your thoughts and then you convene 
you know, the board of Facebook, what, what are those first couple recommendations that you might make to address this issue? Wow. What a, what a question, right? Um, <laughs> I dig the scenario. I like it. That's, Let's play it out. <laughs> it's a job. It's a job I might actually be willing to take. Um, <laughs> the, I think there's it, <laughs> one of the, what they say about absolute power, uh, Mr. Harris. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Well, that's maybe one of the things I would, I would be changing is the, um, accountability for some kind of democratic governance for how these platforms are designed. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing that affects this many people should be governed by the worldview of one person with their limited life experiences and subjective experience. Um, you know, it, 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 I just want to say this is an unprecedented kind of ethical and um, even like urban planning kind of question where you're designing an urban plan diagram, a wiring diagram for basically all of human civilization and your decisions are going to be leveraged at scale, meaning you're not gonna create all these different wiring diagrams, you know, one for India, one for Myanmar, one for Ethiopia, one for the US. I mean, ideally it would work that way. It would be decided locally and democratically by um, those countries and populations, but that gets into this whole rabbit hole that your, maybe your listeners are getting a taste of, which is to say, how do you do culturally appropriate wiring diagrams that enhance and elevate the wisdom of each society as opposed to the worst aspects of each society? And who would you trust in that country to do so? One of the problems that Facebook has right now is, do we work with the government of, you know, some kind of repressive regime and let, are they the ones to be trusted and say, you have the keys and reins on how you want to set up the news feeds in your country? Because we know what they'll do. In fact, we see Vietnam and other places where you have governments who are actually stepping into Facebook and using it as a tool to suppress um, and repress, you know, the dissident voices in that country and go after them. So it's, it's an incredibly hard problem. But what I would do is I would, I would somehow change my whole platform to be uh, freed up to operate for the public interest. I would use my billions of dollars to buy back um, whatever sort of um, uh, uh, you know, stake that, that the rest of the world uh, has in it and then turn over all my shares to a public democratic governance model. Um, I would uh, have a separation of church and state for decisions that are made to uh, work on engagement or the basic minimal usage of the product so that it maintains its status as a network and instead um, have a separate church and state between those sides of the work and the side that's all about improving um, the social measures that we care about. So polarization, I would put in measures for perception gaps. I would change the fundamental design. I would immediately start a new design process for um, not making it about the virality of content overall. Um, I'd probably think about um, uh, in the way that we have zoning laws in a city where we have the commercial zone and we have a residential zone and we have parks and we have and those things are separately zoned things in a city. I'd probably think about zoning between political discussions and non-political discussions. Um, mm -hmm. we, this is a whole discipline and field that needs, you know, billions and billions of dollars of research to understand what public interest technology looks like. It's not like there's some manual where one of our ancient philosophers said, oh, that's nice, you know, John, Kieran, and Tristan, you guys are thinking about these questions, but 2000 years ago, we actually thought about how to wire up a digital city and wire up the paleolithic emotions of all of humanity across cultural borders. Like there is no textbook for this, but I do think that it's gonna start by um, centering um, human fragilities and human um, weaknesses at the, at the center of what's gone wrong. Uh, and, and I would also distribute at the beginning a kind of a public service announcement, a kind of apology to the whole world that tried to deconstruct. Uh, it's not about just clearing reputation and you know, uh, relinquishing yourself of your sins, but the world needs to understand at scale the mass warping that we have gone through. We've actually gone under a second pandemic while we've had the coronavirus pandemic. And that second pandemic came from the Zuckerberg Institute of Virology that was doing gain of function research on reality warping viruses, like literally you know, memes, right? You have ideas that go viral, like a virus, and this classic gain of function research is you're tweaking the viruses to see what well, if we show more to these kinds of people, like the QAnon people or to the extreme leftists or whatever, you know, they get more viral. And that's what they're doing every day. They're doing A-B tests on how do we see which memes go the most viral. And that created this sort of reality warping unleashing of these mimetic viruses that kind of shut down the global sense-making apparatus of the world. And we haven't even acknowledged that this has happened. And I think, again, to create that shared object, that shared understanding about the breakdown of shared understanding, the platforms that are best positioned to deliver that this even took place are the platforms that reach 3 billion people themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I, with The Social Dilemma, and you with your podcast reaching 100,000 people, 
And even the government can't reach as many people as the platforms can about what has happened. And I think we need to deconstruct this and name this kind of warping that's taken place and hit a little bit of a reset button to cool down some of all the tensions that we've all been uh, experiencing around the world because people really can't distinguish again between their thoughts and what feels real. And when technology has been the generator function for 3 billion people's thoughts, the front page of our own minds, we, we have to be able to uh, go through a transition like that. And that's a lot to throw at you, but that's <laughs> probably some taste of what I would start thinking about. Hmm. Well, we've got a succession plan in place, Mr. Zuckerberg. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know where to find Mr. Harris. Um, geez, Tristan, uh, this has been a remarkable conversation and uh, I'm tempted to, uh, to, to push it, uh, push it a little bit further. Uh, you have time for one more question? Yes, I can go uh, for another 15 or so minutes, I think is what I've got. Okay, good deal. Um, and we can go shorter if we need to. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, I wonder the, um, you know, I alluded to that phrase, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, you know, you spoke to the challenge of, you know, wiring, uh, you know, uh, a sort of communications uh, and knowledge sharing structure for all of humanity. And it makes one suspect potentially that, you know, perhaps it is the case that technology at this scale is just sort of unmanageable by definition in some sense. I mean, we could imagine a humane social media platform that perhaps is constructed in a way that reintroduces the various sorts of points and, and, and levers by which we can identify and act upon the nuanced uh, aspects of interpersonal communication so as to provide a more comprehensive and um, sort of understandable picture of who the human being is on the other side of the communication. But when you think about building that system, uh, building some model up in a way to where that mode of interaction works as effectively in India as it does in South Africa, as it does in the United States, perhaps that's possible. But the conservative in me, you know, and, and I should just say the, the generic kind of conservative uh, caution with respect to government policy in general is just that there, there tends to be a limit to the efficacy of top-down, one-size-fits-all solutions and that the one thing you can always count upon uh, when one tries to act at scale with respect to the application of government power and policy anyway uh, is the uh, the law of unintended consequences and you know that's not to draw too direct an analogy because these are different conversations but with respect to social media do you think that some of the answer here has to be in competition and migration away from there being just sort of a few uh, multinational platforms with hundreds of millions and billions of users into sort of a more sort of, you know, I hate to use the term balkanized because it has negative conversation connotations and we strive against balkanization in the context of political polarization. And yet, you know, perhaps a, a you know, a, federalized or even just sort of, um, you know, a communitarian, a communitarian, there you go, a communitarian sort of social media landscape, where in, you know, you have um, competition or interaction between various platforms that ideally would be seeking to correct for the um, inhumane kind of, uh, you know, uh, formula for, for, um, convening and brokering communication that is consolidated in the major platforms. Is there hope to be invested in a, in a uh, multitude of different approaches to this particular kind of um, technological service? Or do we need to figure out just how it is we can go about potentially you know, influencing the major structures that exist or the population at scale so as to demand changes from these, from these dominant platforms, given the fact that it does not seem like they are going to go away anytime soon or to clear the board for, for other approaches, I guess, to 
to take root at a similar level of scale? Yeah, what a question. Um, I think that um, we obviously need a whole plethora of, of approaches to think about communications. And I think just to latch onto the earliest thing you said, which is, can you build a global instantaneous communications infrastructure where any message goes viral to millions of other people instantly right. <laughs> and have that not destabilize or not just destabilize, but to basically sow chaos. And I, it's like a tower of Babel sort of, sort of scenario, I suppose. We, are we really wise enough to wield this? This is a form of godlike technology, just to be clear. It's a godlike psychological influence technology, meaning that one person can literally click a button on their phone. I mean, Trump could trigger the whole world <laughs> for good and for bad, you know, 20 times a day. And, and it would influence the entire world's emotions. That is a godlike psychological influence capacity. You're Zeus, but instead of, you know, a lightning bolt, you've got a psychological lightning bolt. Right. Right? And even if you don't know what you're doing, you bump your elbow and you scorch half of earth, right? You, you cannot have God-like powers without the wisdom, love, and prudence of gods, which is the line from Barbara Marx Hubbard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why E.O. Wilson's line is so important, which is that what are the ways that we can wield these God-like powers? Should we? Or should we actually be better? Would we be better off um, scaling down the, the dangerous God-like communication capacities down to something that we can guarantee is, is safer? And I do know that a principle of humane technology is that with great power has to come great responsibility. And in general, in our society, we couple the increasing power that we grant with increasing responsibility and orientation for um, others. Uh, so for example, I can go buy a pair of knives, which is a kind of technology from a kitchen store. I don't have to do a background check or do a driver's license ID check or demonstrate that I have training with those knives because there's only so much damage I could do by accident with the non-godlike power of a knife. If I'm getting an AK-47 or semi-automated weapons, theoretically, there should be a background check, real training, and real checks and balances on that system to prevent that godlike power, more godlike power, really, to, you know, from harming people. But if I'm going to manage, say, the nuclear weapon system, I have to probably have gone through deep military training, have multiple accountability sources, democratic governance, and um, have the wisdom to, uh, to, to be wielding and making decisions at, at that scale. Right. So what we've done though, if you think about this in the or now orienting it in communications, if I'm gonna reach 10 people with my speech in a soapbox, of course I have freedom of speech, but if I'm gonna reach a football stadium sized audience and I can just say whatever comes out of my amygdala that day, you know, that's, that's not godlike responsibility linked with godlike powers. And we are each now walking BBC television stations or, BB, or you know, MTV stations. Think about the kids, 15-year-olds with Instagram accounts that reach 2 million, 3 million, 10 million people spreading information about what you should do for COVID, what you shouldn't do for COVID, or the best way to sleep, or you know, whether climate change is real. I think the social dilemma captures some of this topic. We have individuals now who have like the equivalent of million, multi-million person audiences with again, the, the capacities of a broadcaster or a publisher without the responsibilities that a BBC would feel towards orienting the public with influencing uh, what people think, feel, and believe about the world. <laughs> that doesn't leave us with an answer, but I think in general, the principle that we would wanna retrieve from the past is what would it look like for, you know, you know, you have different responsibilities for zero to a hundred people that you're reaching versus zero to a million uh, versus a million people versus a hundred million people. And I think the greater the power, the more our orientation towards the public good or the commons has to be. Uh, meaning if I'm sharing information and going to reach people's attention at that large enough scale, you know, I think about it even in principle in a room, uh, I used to think about pre-COVID, you know, if one person is gonna occupy the attention of a hundred people, they probably should have something to say that's a hundred times more valuable than those people having one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, our attention economy is not organized that way. And just to make this existential, our attention economy is the, the collective sort of agenda of humanity of what we think of that as important, what we do, what we spend our time on. And when we have serious problems like pandemics, climate change, nuclear warfare, um, infrastructure, geopolitical competition with China, if our agenda instead represents, well, here's the latest hypocritical thing that I don't like the other tribe said, and here's infinite evidence about why I can feel smug that day, that's not going to get us to actually caring about and dealing with the real 
uh, bigger challenges that we face. And that's my, my highest level concern is that right now we have two competing uh, brain implant um, models. We have the Western brain implant in which you, know, you get the Facebook, Googles, YouTubes, TikToks of the world. And it just wires up your society for kind of social epileptic shock where you're kind of writhing on the floor, not doing anything in chaos because every neuron is firing every other neuron. You're foaming at the mouth and not getting anything done. Or you have the Eastern brain implant where you have sort of Orwellian thought reading and mind control and mass behavior modification, but the sort of sociopathic organism just follows orders and is super efficient and powerful and plowing along. Mm. What we need is a democratic, a Western uh, liberal brain implant that is almost the equivalent of the, it has to outcompete the Chinese brain implant, but it has to do so while maintaining um, freedom of thought, um, sovereignty, agency, et cetera, and be increasing each of our collective capacities to make sense in the world and make better choices. That's the only way that we're gonna actually, I think, make it through the next uh, century. And uh, I actually think that at that scale, what we need is something like a digital Bretton Woods <laughs> to come up with a Western collective digital infrastructure that is humane, that helps us communicate, that retrieves the principles that we're missing uh, and gets us closer to uh, you know, a world that, that we want to live in. Hmm. Well, one thing that I'm convinced of is that uh, we are in a moment in time wherein as bleak as we might get the sense of the present as being, there is work to be done that can nevertheless, I think, pave the way towards a future that allows us to harness the humane impulses of the human personality and to find a way to use the creative capacity of human beings uh, to build out structures that really do call forth the better angels of one another's nature. And, um, you know, uh, if, if anybody doubts that that's possible, I think all they have to do is look at the success of the social media, of the social dilemma, rather, of the documentary that you were a star of and the impact that you yourself are having and the team at uh, Center for Humane Technology and folks like you um, on the thinking of societies across the world, there's clearly a hunger uh, to see that these problems be engaged and that we innovate our way towards sustainable societies and that we do so in a manner that coheres with our higher moral uh, aspirations, um, again, as, uh, as, you know, as, as nations and perhaps just as a species, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm certain that we can't get there without folks like yourself. So Tristan, thank you so much for joining us in the Braver Angels podcast, brother. And thank you for the honor of, uh, of uh, our being able to engage in this dialogue with you in an ongoing sort of way. It's certainly been a pleasure for Kieran and for I. Totally my pleasure. And I think the work you're doing is so important. And I hope uh, this conversation maybe engages listeners in thinking about, you know, how can the digital world not cause mass polarization and have the analog world through analog, well, you know, through small group conversations not catch up at this you know, smaller pace that you guys are doing that's so important, but what would it look like to scale up how we unweave this, this derangement of our collective psyche? And I think you guys are really offering some of the best lessons for how to do that in intimate settings. And I just hope maybe your listeners think about and join us in figuring out what does that look like in a more humane world? And how can we change these platforms to, to be doing that positive thing? Because we really don't have time to do anything else. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity we got to, to speak about this today. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. Kieran, go ahead and take us home, brother. Yes. Well, my thanks to you, John, for driving this forward, to Tristan for coming on, and to everyone who's listening. You can find Tristan Harris online at the Center for Humane Technology. Send us an email. Let us know what you thought about this podcast, media at braverangels.org. We take uh, questions, compliments, criticisms, suggestions. We take it all. And if you like what you heard, please rate us five stars, leave us a review. And stay tuned for the next episode. Take care, folks.